Good morning. I welcome you as we gather on this third Sunday of Pentecost, and it's going to be a little different this morning. Uh, Horatio Castro, our music director, as some of you know, is in Argentina. His father had a stroke a little over a week ago, and we had a substitute pianist lined up for this morning, and at 8.30 I received a phone call. She just tested positive for COVID. So we will do our best to rejoice and be glad. It's interesting, the sermon this morning is on being outside your comfort zone. <laughs> but I do welcome you. We won't be singing hymns. We will be doing the sung responses. So the order of worship will be a little condensed. And as I say, we will still rejoice and be glad. I want to thank Daniela Gutierrez, who is our tech person this morning. The altar flowers are given in memory of George LePurge by his family. And the cupola this week will be lit for Sharon McGilvery with love and prayers from her friends. And I'm pretty sure our Minister of Discipleship has at least one announcement. Good morning. Good morning. Next week is the Strawberry Festival that we are hosting in conjunction with the Historical Society. I think we still need one more volunteer to help make and serve the strawberry shortcake. So if you are available, please let myself or Don Putney know. Um, also, we are bringing back from many years ago the birthday and anniversary list. We would like to be able to wish each other a happy birthday and a happy anniversary. But we are asking you that if you would like your birthday and anniversary included, that you opt in and fill out a form to make sure we have accurate information and to make sure that we know where you would like us to share the information, whether on bulletin boards, Hilltop News, social media, etc. So there is a link in the Hilltop News, and we invite you to please fill that out if you would like your birthday or anniversary included. Thank you. Also, as you enter the sanctuary on the table to your right, we are putting out their large print bulletins for those who would like to use them. Are there any other announcements? If not, then let us draw near to God's throne of grace and rejoice in the love that is from everlasting to everlasting. Please join me in the call to worship. Here in this place, new light is streaming. Now is the darkness vanished away. Here in this place, we bring fears and our yearnings. Brought to you, Lord, in the light of this day. We are the young, our lives are a mystery. We are the old who long for your face. Gather us in and hold us forever. Gather us in and make us your own. Call to us now, and we shall awaken. We shall arise at the sound of our name. Please join me in the prayer of invocation. God, whose glory called the worlds into being, and put within me the breath of life, here in the peace of your sanctuary, help me to hear you calling to me in the still, small voice that can only be heard in the stillness of my heart. Speak to me, Lord, and fill me with the spirit of life that danced upon the heads of the disciples on that great day of Pentecost. This I ask that I may embrace the gift of life that is before me and faithfully follow the Christ who has called us all to follow him and who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I invite you to stand. 
Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be. Please be seated. We have been blessed in so many ways. We come this day to give thanks to God for those blessings with our words and our deeds of loving kindness. So let us answer the call to follow the Christ as we come now to God's altar with our tithes and our offerings. dedication. God of blessings, great and small, we know that there is nothing in all creation that can separate us from your love for us in Christ Jesus our Lord. So we come to your altar now with humble hearts and pray that you will use this offering to weave a little more hope and peace and joy into the lives of your children around the corner and around the world. For we ask it in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please be seated. I'd like to invite the boys and girls to please join me. Good morning, it's good to see you. And I have a question. Is school ending this week? 
Oh, yours has already ended? Yeah. And you go to kindergarten or nursery? You go to kindergarten. So next year, you're going to be in first grade. Hello. Good morning. Uh huh. Has school ended for you? So you're all out of school already? Yeah. Oh, next year you'll be in kindergarten. Oh, okay. So have you got any big plans for the summer? Going to go on vacation? Yeah? Well, oh, you went to Cape Cod? Oh, you're going to Cape Cod. That's a wonderful place to be. Well, so, you know, people like to do things when they're on vacation. And on the summer, you get a lot of vacation. Some people like to play golf. Not me, I'm a terrible golfer. And of course, no golf on Sunday morning. And let me see, maybe you'll go to the park, right? Anybody play frisbee? <laughs> Good catch, she caught it. <laughs> and how many of you like to go to the beach? I like going to the beach as well, but I need my beach chair. And let me see. It gets bright sun out there, doesn't it? Absolutely. So I need my sunglasses and a book to read. I'm reading this one. Someone gave it to me for Christmas. It's called Wholehearted Faith. And it's a very good book. But when you go to the beach, you might do some different things, right? Like, how many of you would make sandcastles? Oh, absolutely. Make lots of sandcastles. You, that's right. And so, there's lots of things that we can do that's really fun in the summer. And the important thing to do is to remember that God is with you no matter where you go. If you go to the park, oh, she's got that over there. You can go to the park, you can go to the mountains, you can go to the beach, yes. Uh huh. So, wherever you are. Oh, so you go with your friends. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh huh. So wherever you go. Okay. Uh huh. So do you play frisbee? Oh, you caught it. Very good. <laughs> so wherever you go. Thank you. Wherever you go, God is there with you. Because God never takes a vacation from us. And God doesn't want us to take a vacation from him. So if you're at the beach, you can give thanks to God for the wonderful water and the sand to play in. You go to the park and you can thank God for the ability to have fun and use your arms to play frisbee. Wherever you are, you can give thanks to God. Having an ice cream cone on a hot day. That's fun, isn't it? And we can give thanks to God for the nice ice cream cone. We can give thanks for God wherever we are. And we know that God is with us. And God doesn't want us to take a vacation from him. And you know one of the things that I look forward to in the summer? Is we have a mystery box. And we're going to start that again. So you're all going to be able to bring in objects for the mystery box for our children's message. And I'm going to invite Ayla to come forward. And why don't you stand over here, Ayla? Come over here. Okay. Let's get real close. Dear God, we thank you for all the seasons and for summer that we will soon be enjoying. We thank you for cookouts 
and trips to the beach and ice cream cones wherever we are. Help us remember that you are there with us and help us to take some time to be with you. Amen. Thank you. And you can all go to the activity up in Fellowship Hall. Please join me in the responsive call to prayer. Draw near to God, and God will draw near to you. Good people, let us enter now into this time of stillness, that we might be one with our God. My sisters and brothers, are there prayers that you would like to lift up this morning to the Lord? Yes, Sandy. I was to pray for Diana Jenkins, third pneumonia. Yes, oh, I received word yesterday that Diana Jenkins is at Winchester Hospital and she has pneumonia. I saw her yesterday, and we ask God's spirit of healing to be upon her. Lord, in your goodness. Also lift up in prayer Karen Marlin, and she is recovering from surgery to remove a brain tumor. I understand that she is doing well, and we give thanks to God for her healing. Lord, in your goodness. So we lift up Nick Fonsolidis' legal assistant, Alana. Uh, she recovers from a rather bad fall. We ask God to, to be with her. Lord, in your goodness. The little boy who was found, yes. So we lift up with heavy hearts the family in Lowell whose little boy unfortunately drowned this past week and we ask that God comfort them in this time of great sorrow. Lord, in your goodness, lift up, of course, our music director Horatio Castro. I did hear from him. He is still in Argentina making arrangements for care for his father and his father had a stroke. His father also is an ador- an, a retired ordained minister. We ask that God be with all of them. Lord, in your goodness. Amen. Lift up Sharon McGilvery as she continues to live with hospice. We surround her with our love and ask that she feel God's spirit with her. Lord, in your goodness. Amen. I spoke to Sandy Hayes this past week and Her son, Billy, down in Florida, who had a stem cell transplant, is slowly doing better, and for that we give thanks. Lord, in your goodness. We also lift up Laura Kaplan's friend, Carolyn, who is on life support. We ask that God be with her and her loved ones as they walk this path. Lord, in your goodness. Let us pray. God of heaven and all that is holy here on earth, we give you thanks for this community of faith that has answered the call to follow your only begotten Son. In these 
challenging times, Lord, we need your grace and your wisdom more than ever. And so we ask you to open our hearts and our minds that we might receive those blessings and that we might faithfully use the gifts that you have bestowed upon us to make this world a little better, even if it's in only some small way. Holy One, you have heard the prayers of your faithful servants, both those that we have uttered and those that are stirring in our hearts. And for that, we give you thanks. In the holy name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning comes to us from the first book of Kings, the 19th chapter, beginning with the first verse. To set this reading in context, I share with you that after King Solomon died, the kingdom of Israel split into two separate kingdoms. There was a northern kingdom consisting of ten tribes that became known as the kingdom of Israel, and then the southern kingdom of Judah and Benjamin that became known as the Kingdom of Judah. The leaders of the Northern Kingdom proved to be very unfaithful to God and the covenant that was given at Mount Sinai. And the reading this morning is about an encounter that Elijah had with Jezebel after Elijah defeats her false prophets in a contest on Mount Carmel, Jezebel is upset with him. And we read these words. Ahab, the king, told Jezebel, his wife, all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, so may the gods do to me and more also if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. Then Elijah was afraid, and he arose and ran for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah. And he left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. And Elijah asked that he might die, saying, It is enough now, O Lord. Take away my life. For I am no better than my father's. And Elijah lay down and slept under the broom tree. And behold, an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. And Elijah looked, and behold, there was at his head a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. And he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came again a second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat for the journey is too great for you. And Elijah arose and ate and drank and went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights to Mount Sinai, the Mount of God. There he came to a cave and lodged in it. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him and said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? Elijah said, I have been very jealous for the Lord the God of hosts. For the people of Israel have sake, forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left. And they seek to take my life away from me. And God said, Go out and stand on the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore the mountains and broke pieces, in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came the sound of a still, small voice. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his faith in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And behold, there, was a voice, there came a voice to him and said, 
what are you doing here, Elijah? He said, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I, only am left. And they seek my life to take it away. And the Lord said to him, go. Return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you arrive, you shall anoint Hazael to be king over Syria. And Yehu, the son of Nimshi, you shall anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abel Maloha, you shall anoint to be prophet in your place. Here ends the reading of God's word. May we receive the wisdom of God's holy word and use it for the glory of our creator and the good of God's children. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts upon the sacred scripture be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and always our redeemer. Amen. <clears throat> when was the last time you found yourself dealing with a situation that pushed you outside your comfort zone. I know when I had it, it happened to me just a couple of minutes ago when I got that phone call. <laughs> it happens from time to time. Maybe it was when you had to give a speech in front of a bunch of people you didn't know. Maybe it's when you had to confront a friend about something he shouldn't have done. Maybe it was when your boss announced that there were going to be layoffs at your company. Or maybe it was when you were dealing with a really overwhelming problem and you had to ask someone to help you. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't like it when I have to venture out of my comfort zone. That's because when you venture out of your comfort zone, it can be stressful and even a little scary. That was certainly true for the husband who had to do the weekly grocery shopping when his wife ended up sick in bed with the flu. Well, all of the products and the prices left the husband feeling dazed and confused. The thing that made the trip to the grocery store Really challenging, though, was his fidgety two-year-old son. While they were in the grocery store, the toddler kept crying and crabbing and complaining about every little thing. At one point, the toddler even managed to climb out of the shopping cart. And before the father knew it, the toddler was off and running. The father chased the toddler down a couple of aisles before he finally managed to scoop the little one up and bring him back to the shopping cart, kicking and screaming all the way. People in the grocery store could tell that the father was doing his best to cope with the troublesome toddler. They even heard him saying things like, just be patient, Tommy. It's OK, Tommy. Hang in there, Tommy. After a while, an elderly woman went over to the father to offer him some words of encouragement. Excuse me, she said, but I just want you to know that I am really impressed with the patience that you have for little Tommy. When the father heard that, he shook his head in disbelief. Lady, he said, you don't know what you're talking about. I'm Tommy, the kid's name is Billy. <laughs> yes, we all have our comfort zones, and it doesn't matter who you are. Sooner or later, something's going to happen, and you're going to be pushed out of your comfort zone, whether you like it or not. Now, 
you are probably going to find this very hard to believe. But when that happens, it can be a blessing. Elijah will tell you that. Elijah will tell you that when you're outside your comfort zone, it makes it possible for you to encounter the spirit of the living God in a way that you really can't when you're safe and secure in your comfort zone. After all, that's what happened to Elijah. It all started, of course, when Jezebel threatened him after he defeated her false prophets on Mount Carmel. When Jezebel found out that all of those false prophets were no longer among the living, she sent a message to Elijah and said to him, may the gods do to me and more so if I do not make your life like the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. In other words, before the day is over, Elijah, you're a dead man. Well, that certainly pushed Elijah out of his comfort zone. And he did a lot of the things that people do when they find themselves outside their comfort zone. The first thing he did was run. He decided that he was going to get as far away from Jezebel as he could. So Elijah ran and he ran and he kept on running until he ended up in Beersheba, which was the very southernmost point of the southern kingdom of Judah. Then after resting there for a couple of days, Elijah started running again. He ran further and further into the wilderness until he ended up in a cave on Mount Sinai. So Elijah responded to the challenge of being outside his comfort zone by running away from the problem. He also responded by venting his anger when he got to Beersheba. We're told that while he was there, he looked up to the heavens and he cried out, it is enough, Lord. Take away my life from me, for I am no better than my ancestors. Then do you remember what Elijah did when he got to Mount Sinai? While he was hiding there in his cave, he threw himself a little pity party. When God asks Elijah what he's doing there, the prophet responds by saying, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the people of Israel have thrown down your altars, forsaken your covenant, and killed your prophets by the sword. And I only am left, and they seek to take my life away from me. Yes, Elijah did a lot of the things that you and I do when we're pushed out of our wonderfully safe and secure comfort zones. But then, something happened. Everything changed when God told Elijah to go out and stand on the mountain. When Elijah did that, we we're told that there was a mighty wind, but God wasn't in the wind. Then there was an earthquake, but God wasn't in the earthquake. And then there was a fire, but God wasn't in the fire. Finally, after that amazing and awesome display of God's power and might, we're told that God spoke to Elijah in a still, small voice. Put it all together, and what happened on that mountain is simple. Elijah came face to face with the Mysterium Tremendum. That's Latin for the tremendous mystery. And not only did that tremendous mystery comfort Elijah, but it also gave him the courage and the confidence that he needed to go back and fulfill his destiny. 
It gave him the comfort and the confidence that he needed to go back and be God's prophet, to go back and be God's kingmaker. In fact, did you notice that one of the people God told Elijah to anoint was Yehu? God told Elijah to anoint Yehu to be the king of Israel. You realize what that means? God had already chosen the king who was going to replace Ahab and Jezebel. Nimshi, or excuse me, Yehu, the son of Nimshi, was the person who was going to put an end to Ahab and Jezebel's wicked ways. Yes, Elijah will tell you that when you're outside your comfort zone, instead of constantly running, the better thing to do is be still and listen to what that still small voice is saying to you. Instead of getting stuck in your anger, be still and listen to what that still small voice is saying to you. Instead of wallowing in self-pity forever and a day, be still and listen to what that still small voice is saying to you. What is that still small voice saying to you as you wrestle with that problem that keeps you awake at night? What is it saying to you when you're angry because you're not seeing eye to eye with someone? What is it saying to you when you're full of sadness because you feel like something is missing in your life? Good people, make no mistake about it. We do need our comfort zones. But if you're not careful, that comfort zone can become a prison that keeps you from becoming the person God wants you to be. That comfort zone can become a prison that keeps you from finding the abundant life that God has prepared for you. A few months ago, I had a conversation that put me a little outside my comfort zone. The person told me that he was worried about our beloved family of faith here at Union Congregational Church. He told me that he wasn't thrilled with the screen here in the sanctuary. But then he said something I didn't expect. He said, but I keep telling myself I can't be selfish because all of this technology is making it possible for people, including elderly members who can't be here on Sunday morning, to worship with us. He also told me that he was a little uncomfortable with the pride ride and some of the other things that we're doing to be an open and affirming congregation. But then he said something I didn't expect. He said, but we have to do something because they're good people too. That grace-filled conversation touched my heart. And as we sat there outside his comfort zone, I could feel the still small voice saying to him, well done, good and faithful servant. The last go thing God wants for any of us is to end up like the mother who got an unexpected question one day as the mother was preparing dinner for the family. Mom, the little girl, asked, why do you cut the end off the ham before you put it in the oven? I don't know, the mother said. My mother always did it. I think it makes the ham taste better. After the conversation was over, the mother picked up the phone and called the little girl's grandmother. Mom, she asked, why do we always cut the end off the ham before we put it in the oven. I don't know, the grandmother said. My mother always did it. I think it makes the ham taste better. Well, after the conversation was over, the grandmother picked up the phone and called the little girl's great-grandmother. Mom, she asked, why do we always cut the end off the ham before we put it in the oven? 
The great-grandmother chuckled. I don't know why you do it, she said, but I always did it to make the ham fit in the pan. <laughs> now, it's one thing to waste a little ham. It's another thing to waste the time that God has given you here on this earth. So don't be surprised if instead of asking, are you comfortable, that still small voice comes to you and challenges you to be a little uncomfortable. Amen. People of God, a service of worship has ended. Let us prepare now to go forth uh, to continue our service of love as uh, we continue our service of love in the name of our Savior. And may the blessing of God Almighty, Creator Christ and Holy Spirit be upon you all. Amen. I invite you to stand. Shalom to you now, shalom, my friend. May God's full mercy bless you, my friend, in all your living and through your loving. Christ be your Shalom, Christ be your